I'll, I'll start by uh, introducing uh, some things related to uh, local planets and exoplanets, um, because it's a broad audience, and then uh, give a brief, brief history of how uh, terrestrial planets are thought to have evolved, and then uh, t talk in general about um, what causes plate tectonics, because uh, the terrestrial planets exhibit several types of uh, tectonic um, behavior. Earth has plate tectonics, other planets so far do not, so one of the major topics of research is uh, what causes plate tectonics. Um, and then I'll present uh, some detailed models, well, that are specific to um, particular planets. Actually, I won't talk much about Earth, but certainly Mars and Venus, and very briefly about super-Earths, because the speaker after me, um, Diana, will focus on super-Earths. Uh, so, convection uh, is, is the key process that, uh, you know, in the mantle. Um, here we have uh, a cross-section of uh, an Earth-like planet. So um, the uh, oceanic plates are created at the ridges and uh, go back into the mantle at the trenches. And the oceanic plates are behaving as the cold upper thermal boundary layer of a convection cell. So they become cold, they sink into the mantle, and then warm up, probably you know, at the bottom where the core is, is uh, relatively hot. And uh, so this is a, a convection system, sort of analogous to a conventional um, sort of convecting um, jar. Um, so it's important to think of the, um, the, at least the oceanic plates on Earth as part of the convection and not as a separate thing. So because in the, in the distant past, you would often hear people talking about plates as a sort of separate thing. And then there's a question that some people, the people who work on the plates usually thought that the plates are driving the convection and the people who work on the mantle think that the mantle is driving the plates. But you should think of them as a one couple system. Um, so to, to survey the terrestrial planets in our solar system, um, you probably recognize this one. And um, it's unique because Earth is the only planet we know of to have plate tectonics, to have liquid water at the surface, uh, to have an oxygen-rich atmosphere, and to have life. <clears throat> The uh, other planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, have effectively a single plate, what's known as a stagnant lid. So there are no um, sharp plate boundaries on these planets. You do see some tectonics. I mean, you see here some, some evidence of crustal deformation, also on Mars. But it's not the same as on Earth, where most of the deformation is focused at narrow plate boundaries and the plates are moving as sort of almost rigid uh, entities. Uh, and the other planets also have atmospheres that are rich in carbon dioxide, not um, nitrogen and oxygen. Uh, and then there are planets around other stars. And here are some, uh, some news headlines from the BBC, my favorite news organization. And, um, you know, just showing that there are a lot of discoveries happening at this um, very time partly because, well, largely because of this Kepler uh, mission. And um, first Earth-sized planet spotted, Earth-like planet confirmed. I'm not sure how confirmed that is. Maybe Diana can discuss that later. But um, Anyway, just because of the, uh, the limits of detection, most of the Earth-like planets that have been discovered so far are larger than Earth because the detection techniques can only find things that are larger than Earth. And they're known as super-Earths. Um, and here's, here's an example of, um, of one, but well, so it's, it looks white, but uh, that's not actually because it's white, it's because we have no data on it, um, or at least no data on what the surface looks like. Um, <coughs> there is some data expected. Um, I mean, the first, first data will be a spectra of the atmosphere. Um, so despite uh, not having any data, there is a growing community of people who are studying these objects, uh, including me. And um, anyway, so we look forward to more data on those. And it's useful to predict what they might be like. Um, <coughs> an important point is that the atmosphere and the, um, or atmosphere, ocean system and the interior are uh, coupled, particularly over long time periods. Because a lot of the constituents in the atmosphere are outgassed from the interior by uh, volcanism. So things like water, nitrogen, you know, carbon dioxide are uh, outgassed. 
And then on some planets, well, particularly um, pl planets with uh, plate tectonics, um, the volatiles can be recycled into the interior. So there's a long-term uh, carbon cycle and long-term water cycle that um, cycles these things between the interior and the exterior. And um, well, I think I have some more, some more about that later. Anyway, so to go through the uh, historical aspects, of course, uh, in the beginning, the planets um, accreted from lots of smaller bodies, and a number of people are doing simulations of the accretion process, where you start off with a lot of small bodies, and then uh, gradually they they uh, collide and combine into larger bodies that end up, you know, being well. You get different uh, distributions because there's some randomness involved, and uh, in the final stages of the of this process. Um, Large impacts are uh, important. Uh, most of the impacts involve bodies that have uh, masses within a factor of 10 of each other. So, you know, they do <coughs> um, release a lot of uh, energy because the, the bodies are large by this time. And uh, I'll, I'll talk later on about how this can have an effect on long-term uh, planetary evolution. Uh, so, after things have settled down a bit, or perhaps contemporaneous with the... Uh, impact stage, <clears throat> at least on larger bodies, you get uh, a magma ocean in which the outer part of the planet is uh, molten or mostly molten, and um, as it solidifies, so to begin with, you end up with a large melt fraction with a few crystals um, beginning to form, and then the question is whether they settle or whether they're held in suspension by the vigorous convection. Uh, as the uh, planet cools, um, then you, you transition to a uh, low melt fraction environment where the uh, melt percolates through the solid. Um, but depending on whether the crystals can settle or not here, you may or may not start off with a compositionally stratified um, mantle. So that's sort of at the moment an important unknown in that uh, we don't really know what the initial condition for long-term calculations is because it depends on what happened here. But uh, it has been pointed out, there's an influential paper in 2007 by Labrosse et al, <coughs> that if the core, well, it's likely that the, uh, the core is, is very hot and started off even hotter, um, you would actually get uh, not one magma ocean, but two. One on the outside, as conventionally thought, and the other uh, above the core. And this is the so-called basal magma ocean that um, over time, would uh, would cool and solidify, but it would take a lot longer because heat loss from the deep mantle is uh, controlled by the convection in the mantle. And because the mantle is very viscous, it's, it's uh, relatively inefficient. So this basal magma ocean would actually survive longer than the shallow magma ocean. And even today, seismologists find features near the core mantle boundary which could be interpreted as partial melt. So these could be the leftovers of the... Uh, basal magma ocean. Another thing to, uh, to bear in mind is that <coughs> as the planet goes through this long-term evolution, um, it may change its, um, its tectonic regime. Today, I said Earth has plate tectonics, but other planets don't. But this could have been different uh, in the past. Uh, Earth may not have always had plate tectonics, or other planets may have had plate tectonics and stopped um, and this is not um, well established, but this is a, a possible regime diagram that was proposed by Norm Sleep in 2000, and it shows how, this is for Earth, so this is the heat flow on this axis, and this is the uh, potential temperature of the mantle, so you start off with a magma ocean, uh, when, when it freezes up, you can transition to plate tectonics, but then... Um, now, according to his, his scenario, if, if it cools down too much, then you could transition to a stagnant lid. And then during the stagnant lid mode, the mantle tends to heat up. Then you could transition to um, back to plate tectonics. And in fact, we do see this type of thing in some uh, numerical calculations. So, I'm not sure that this diagram is correct, but it's important to bear in mind that you can get dramatic changes in a planet's tectonic behavior with time. Um, now, I showed this slide before, and 
I'm going to um, just elaborate a bit. So, I study uh, mantle convection, and you can see that on this diagram, it's at the center of everything. Um, so, mantle convection, well, this is a diagram by Dave Stevenson, who was my PhD advisor. Anyway, so, <coughs> mantle convection is responsible for plate tectonics and volcanism, and there's, as I was describing, interaction between plate tectonics and volcanism in the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, life. And uh, mantle convection also um, controls the heat flow coming out of the core. <coughs> Not only the total heat flow, but also the lateral variation in heat flow. And both of those have a strong influence on convection in the core, which uh, generates the dynamo. So in, in this sense, mantle convection also controls the uh, geodynamo. And then the, the um, existence of a geodynamo is also thought to be, <coughs> by many people, important um, for life, because it shields the surface of the planet from dangerous uh, radiation. Anyway, now to uh, talk a bit more about the um, long-term carbon cycle, here's the, uh, the, the air, the ocean, and the mantle. So <coughs> the cycling between these different uh, environments. But if we look at the numbers, this is the amount of uh, carbon that's uh, in these different environments. And you see the mantle, 18,000, whatever units these are, and ocean, 6.6, .6, air, 0 0.12. So most of the carbon <coughs> in the Earth system is actually in the mantle. And then the second, second biggest reservoir is the oceanic crust, and then uh, the ocean and air have relatively little of it. And actually we... There was a talk yesterday that was sort of related to this. I mean, the, the Earth's atmosphere has not always been the same. Um, started off rich in carbon dioxide and very little oxygen, and then uh, at some point, 2 to 2.5 billion years ago, the amount of oxygen rose, and then it um, rose further more recently. Um, so, you know, the Earth is constantly, or <clears throat> has been changing quite a lot in the past. Uh, and this is, it's important that uh, people who study the, the interior think about um, the atmosphere and ocean because uh, that's going to be one of the first uh, observations of extrasolar planets. So we need to understand how they're linked and how they co-evolve over long time periods. So Earth's atmosphere has certainly changed over billions of years. So if we saw Earth now, when it was one billion years old, it would look a lot different than it does today. And... <clears throat> So it's linked to the interior, and, it, and plate tectonics plays a key role. Um, so let's focus on uh, plate tectonics. <coughs> As I mentioned, um, Earth is unusual. Mars has a, um, a rigid or stagnant lid. These terms are sort of used interchangeably. There's been some suggestion that it may have had plate tectonics early on, but it's very uncertain. <coughs> Venus the same. There have been various suggestions that perhaps it used to have plate tectonics and it shut off, or that it, uh, it undergoes a sort of episodic burst of plate tectonics. And um, people also think that Earth may have been different early on. It, it, there's, there are various arguments why present-day subduction would not work if the Earth was, is a lot hotter and the oceanic crust is therefore thicker. So, it's possible that there are different uh, tectonic regimes. Um, and I will talk more about Venus later uh, for modeling. So, uh, I'll, I'll mention now that one of the curious things about Venus is that uh, the surface uh, could, well, it's thought to have a relatively uniform age um, of about, well, depends on who's, who, which paper you read, but let's say 600 million years. And uh, one hypothesis to explain this is sort of global resurfacing event this time ago. Um, there are other hypotheses as well, but that's something to bear in mind. Some people think or have proposed that there may be um, some type of subduction taking place today because this is actually um, part of the surface of Venus and you see features here that look very much like subduction zones at the surface of Earth. So perhaps, you know, incipient or you know, 
localized uh, subduction. But <coughs> these things are by no means certain. Um, there are various possible mechanisms, episodic plate tectonics, succession of plate tectonics, a single overturn event, random resurfacing, which just gives the appearance of, of a uniform age, or uh, something completely different, anyway. And uh, for early Earth, um, they're also suggested, or it's thought that it could have had a different type of plate tectonics, and um, the main reason is that um, when the planet is hotter, the oceanic crust that forms at, um, at a mid-ocean ridge would be thicker. And the oceanic crust is buoyant, and that would make the slab buoyant, so it wouldn't want to go down as a coherent uh, unit. Uh, and it would also, the, uh, everything presumably would be um, moving faster so that the oceanic plates would be younger by the time they get to the subduction zone. So both of these things would lead to more difficulty in, in having Earth-like or present-day subduction. Um, so various things have been proposed, such as subduction taking place below a, a crust that doesn't subduct, plate boundaries that are more distributed, or no plate tectonics. <clears throat> anyway, so let's uh, talk more about um, plate tectonics and modeling plate tectonics. And uh, the basic problem is that uh, the viscosity of rocks is very temperature dependent. And <clears throat> if you just put in the simplest uh, type of viscosity law, exponential viscosity proportional to exponential some activation energy over kT, <coughs> where E is something sort of measured from laboratory experiments, and you calculate the viscosity contrast over the lithosphere, where the surface temperature is about 300 and the temperature below the lithosphere is about 1600 K, then uh, you get a variation of about 48 orders of magnitude of viscosity. And um, <coughs> this would predict that uh, most of the lithosphere, most of this cold upper boundary layer, is not deforming at all. <coughs> and in fact, when people do experiments with this large viscosity variation, you do get a stagnant lid, and then convection takes place below the stagnant lid with a much smaller viscosity contrast, something like a factor 10. So this could be what's happening on uh, Mars and Venus, a stagnant lid, convection below the stagnant lid with a small, small temperature contrast and a small viscosity contrast. Um, and the problem uh, with, um, with understanding plate tectonics is that uh, it's very complex. Rock deformation itself is complex. Um, you get not only viscous deformation, but also brittle failure, uh, plasticity, elasticity, and many of these modes are non-linear. Um, the rheology de depends on things like grain size, the uh, composition, both of major elements and of trace elements like water, well, particularly water. Um, so it's very complicated. And uh, also it's multi-scale. Um, you know, you see faults. If you go to the mountains, you see some faults which have a thickness of millimeters. But um, you know, continents and mantle convection have a length scale of thousands of kilometers. And time scales. The earthquakes occur on time scales of seconds, whereas we're interested in the evolution over billions of years. So um, this just illustrates that. Here are some faults, here are some folds. This is the large scale. Um, additionally, there are compositional variations. Um, seismic tomography, um, at least the conventional argument is that uh, you can't explain variations in seismic velocity in Earth's interior purely from thermal variations. I mean, some people question this, but anyway. So you need uh, both compositional and thermal variations, and compositional is on the right, thermal on the left, from some inversion, to explain the um, seism seismology, apparently. But also, if you see outcrops of mantle rocks in the field, you see strips of, of compositionally distinct uh, material with a length scale of tens of centimeters. So, and geochemists analyze the composition of mantle rocks, um, sort of erupted 
the salts and um, you know, find variations over very small length scales in the trace element uh, ratios. Anyway, so um, well, let's, I think that basically repeats what I've said already. But let's um, talk about how we can uh, simplify things to try and get a first order version of plate tectonics. Um, we can note that um, rocks have a finite strength. So <laughs> when you uh, compress a rock, it eventually um, fails. And the differential stress that you need to apply for the rock to fail depends on the confining pressure. So this is a plot of uh, differential stress versus confining pressure. And this is the, um, the line at which the rock uh, basically fails. And at uh, low pressures, it fails by the formation of a single large crack. At the intermediate pressures in this so-called semi-brittle regime with lots of micro cracks, and at higher pressure in uh, more of a ductile mode. So, but it seems like the, the um, so we can think of this in terms of a yield stress. So at some stress, the rock yields, and this yield stress depends on pressure. It increases, but eventually it seems to more or less saturate. So at some pressure, it doesn't get much higher, or doesn't get higher very quickly with increasing pressure. So, um, and this has led people to propose uh, strength profiles of the lithosphere that look something like this. So this would be the continent. So the strength increases with, uh, with depth until it reaches some saturation point. And then you reach the mantle where the strength is governed by viscous processes. And this is the oceanic lithosphere. Um, but you notice that the value of this, uh, this yield stress is quite high. It's like uh, 600, well, <coughs> you don't know yet that it's high. But I'll, I'll tell you that it's, it's high compared to the stresses that we can generate by mantle convection. So uh, 600 to 800 megapascals. Um, so what happens if we simply add this type of uh, yield stress behavior to an otherwise um, temperature-dependent uh, rheology and run some convection calculations? And uh, so this is what we get. Um, so these are simulations of uh, mantle convection where the physical properties are very, very simple. You just have a temperature-dependent viscosity plus um, plastic yielding when you reach some specified yield stress. And when this yield stress is very high, then you do get the stagnant lid mode. This is viscosity, and uh, you see a, uh, a single plate, your stagnant lid, and small-scale convection at reduced temperature contrast below the stagnant lid. And then, um, then if you reduce this yield stress, you get something that looks like plate tectonics. Uh, here we see something that looks like uh, mid-ocean ridges, spreading centers. So the, the oceanic plates are very thin here, and they spread going away from... Uh, so they, they're moving apart from this plate boundary. And uh, this is a subduction zone-like boundary. This is one of the plates going down. Um, so simply having these two ingredients, temperature-dependent viscosity plus yielding, seems to give a sort of first-order approximation of plate tectonics in numerical models. Um, and then um, my former student um, was doing these types of experiments in uh, 3D spherical geometry instead of Cartesian geometry. And we also get the same type of transitions. So stagnant lid at high really number, uh, sorry, high um, yield stress, um, something like plate tectonics, that intermediate yield stress. And then if the yield stress is quite low, then you get more distributed deformation of the lithosphere. Um, of course, I've got some movies. So this is the stagnant lid mode. Um, again, it's the lithosphere that hardly deforms and um, small-scale convection taking place below the stagnant lid. Blue, blue is cold and red is hot. Um, this is an example of the mobile lid mode, sort of like plate tectonics, but not exactly like plate tectonics, as I'll discuss. So blue is cold, so we're seeing um, slabs going down and uh, cold parts of the lithosphere, and um, red is hot. 
So looking at this frame, for example, we can, this is red. So this is a spreading center. Uh, seems to be another spreading center. Here's another example that's a bit easier to interpret. So red. So things that, so, so say, um, yellow is, is strong here and, um, blue and, and purple is weak. So these are the plate boundaries. These are the plates. And, um, you can see comparing it with the temperature that this is a spreading center and, uh, that this is a subduction zone. And it's quite uh, time dependent. Um, okay, so by running uh, a lot of experiments and uh, comparing it to theory, you can develop some scalings. And I think Diana's going to discuss scalings more in the next talk, so I won't dwell on it. But you know, you can discuss, you can uh, predict whether or not you should be in the stagnant lid or mobile lid mode as a function of Rayleigh number and yield stress. Uh, also as a function of internal heating rate. And um, the basic uh, conclusions from this are that uh, plate tectonics is favored at higher mantle viscosity, which means lower Rayleigh number. That surprises some people, because normally you think that more vigorous convection should be more likely to result in plate tectonics, but you actually get lower stresses if you have a lower viscosity. And um, lower internal heating. Now, both of these things... Uh, decreased as the Earth has cooled over geological time. So the viscosity is, well, viscosity has become higher as the mantle cools and the internal heating rate has decreased because the radiogenic elements uh, decay. And um, this has led to transitions. Well, it could lead to transitions from stagnant to episodic to plate tectonics-like behavior. Um, I'll skip this because Diana will talk about this. So let's talk about um, um, the influence of continents. And recently, uh, my student has been running calculations that have both continents and uh, plate tectonics. And this is one uh, example. So you see again the plate boundaries, and then we also have these uh, relatively rigid uh, continents on top. And the question is, how do they influence the dynamics or influence the scalings. Well, one... Um, Can you say how that's different to the previous experiment? Well, yeah, th uh, here we have these, um, these things are continents, whereas before it was purely oceanic uh, plates. So the, in the previous experiments, it was an ocean planet, only oceanic plates. Here we have continents and oceans. Um, and one, one quantitative difference is that uh, this influences the, uh, whether or not you have plate tectonics. So here's a regime diagram of uh, relative continental area from, from zero, and this is uh, yield stress. And uh, you see that um, when you have no continent, there's a transition between mobile to stagnant lid at a relatively low uh, yield, yield stress. When you have a continent present, this critical yield stress is substantially higher. So continents help plate tectonics. It's easier to get plate tectonics when continents are around. Um, I think this is supposed to uh, be animated. <laughs> not quite sure why it's not working. Yeah, here we go. Um, so here we have... Um, one continent, which you can't, oh, here it is. It's a very big continent and um, a supercontinent. And you see you often get uh, subduction at the edge of the continent. Um, now here's an example with uh, several continents, and the difference to the previous animation is that the velocity arrows are now on there. So you see that it's uh, quite time dependent. Sometimes the continents are, are together in a relatively compact configuration. Sometimes they're apart. And the dynamics of the oceanic areas is influenced by the, um, by the distribution of the continents. And one thing, another way we can plot this is in terms of the the age of the oceans. Okay, so 
you can convert or you can calculate what the, the age of different parts of the ocean is and scale that to, to on, on Earth it goes up to about 200, so you can scale it to that. And then you can um, make a movie of that. Whoops. So you just saw 4.6 billion years flashing by. And um, so this is <coughs> interesting. We recently had a, had a paper on this that um, if you plot the, the uh, distribution of oceanic um, ages for the Earth, you get uh, this picture on the left, which uh, this is age, this is relative area with this age. And um, you see that um, it can be fit by an approximately triangular distribution. And that's sort of surprising from the perspective of convection because uh, normally you, you, you would expect that the plates are ready to go down at some particular age. So you'd expect it to be more or less flat and then once plates reach a certain age, they're ready to, to go down. So it should be sort of flat and then tail off. Um, and in fact, when you, when you do calculations with only plates and no continents, you do get something like that. That's the, um, so a much broader curve with no, no subduction at very young ages. Uh, on the other hand, when you do uh, convection calculations that are isoviscous, except for having strong continents, you get something very different, where there's a lot of subduction at young ages and not much at older ages. So it really seems that um, you need this combination of, of plate tectonics and continents mm -hmm. to, to give you this sort of triangular-like distribution. And so somehow the continents are sort of forcing subduction of relatively young oceanic lithosphere, um, which doesn't take place if you don't have continents, and this allows you to get this distribution. But uh, the distribution is not always triangular. We can look at different uh, sort of periods during the system's evolution, and uh, sometimes it's triangular, sometimes it's more flattened, sometimes it's like this. And um, apparently this is also consistent with the Earth. We talked to uh, Dietmar Muller. He likes this. He thinks that the Earth... You know, based on plate reconstructions, that the Earth was also like this, changing with time. Um, but a problem with the well, a problem with the models I've showed so far is that subduction is typically double-sided, and um, we've been looking at one assumption that, that's made in uh, these calculations, which is a free-slip upper boundary condition, and that implicitly assumes that the surface is flat, whereas the surface of the Earth is not flat, as we see here. There's a trench at the subduction zone. And uh, so we had a paper recently where we examined the influence of the surface boundary condition on convection. So with free slip, you get symmetric double-sided subduction. But when you add a proper free surface, that means that it can move up and down, then uh, you do get single-sided subduction. So simply uh, changing this, the boundary condition at the top seems to flip the system from double-sided subduction to single-sided subduction. And you can come up with the regime diagram. And then you can do nice 3D spherical simulations, which look better. Uh, so here we see. So we start off by imposing sort of symmetric um, subduction zones. And then it naturally develops a, uh, a preference for single-sided um, subduction, which we see happening here. So there's rollback of the, uh, of the trench. Um, in several places. Okay. And you see some interesting behaviors in these models. Uh, here, for example, we can see a, uh, a slab tearing off, which is thought to have happened to some slabs in Earth. So this is Example of slab detachment by tearing. Um, but let's, well actually I think I'll, I'll sort of, well, <clears throat> I already mentioned that compositional variations uh, exist and there are various models for, over time people have proposed different models for how to explain these, these compositional variations. I think Alan McNamara will talk more about that. So I'll just note that we are working on this aspect and uh, talk now about Mars for a few minutes. Um, so, one of the, um, the main characteristics of Mars is the crustal dichotomy. So, smooth, relatively low crust in the north, um, more cratered, um, 
highlands in the south, and uh, here's, here's more of a map view. So there have been various hypotheses for what causes the crustal dichotomy, and one of them is convection. So it turns out that if you have the right um, viscosity profile, then convection tends to form a, a, a degree one pattern like this, and when you calculate the crust that uh, forms from convection like this, then you get um, a distribution that somewhat resembles the distribution on Mars. So it does seem that other considerations for the moment not accounted for, that um, you can form a Mars-like crustal distribution by internal processes. Here we go. Uh, here we go. Here's the comparison of the model with Mars. And if, if we did a bit of image processing on this, we could make it look more like Mars, I think. But, um, but and here's, here's a, an histogram of the crust. Actually, the, the problem with this is that it does take relatively long for this um, dichotomy to form, as in hundreds of millions of years. Whereas some planetary geologists think that the dichotomy should form very quickly, or there's evidence that the dichotomy did form very quickly. So the other main hypothesis for um, forming a dichotomy is uh, an impact. And this goes back to something I said earlier. So we've, we've also been considering the influence of uh, what happens if you have a, an impact in one, a giant impact in one area. These calculations, what, what's hap what, what these are simulating is um, core formation. And there's a, th these are blobs of metal. And uh, there's a particularly large blob of metal here, which represents the core of an impactor. Notice that the impactor also causes a temperature perturbation. And then you run the calculation, and you can predict, th this is very short time scale, a few, few millions, actually a few tens of thousands of years. And um, you get a, a, a temperature distribution. And the region where the impactor, the large impactor uh, was, is hotter. And what this causes over time, this is time, is that you get a thicker crust over the region where the large impact occurred. And uh, this can happen uh, relatively uh, quickly. So a combination of, um, of a, a large impact that causes one sort of a large region of the mantle to be slightly hotter, plus the production of crust by uh, melting of the mantle, can uh, be another explanation for the dichotomy that makes it somewhat quicker. And we can also sort of match um, Mars crustal distribution histogram. Um, so I have maybe five minutes left. I'll say a few words about Venus. Now we're also happy running models of Venus. Venus does not have a crustal dichotomy, but it also doesn't have plate tectonics. Um, well, one, one of the characteristics is that the geoid and topography, this is topography, this is geoid, are very, very uh, similar. So, um, one of the main questions about Venus is whether it always had a stagnant lid or whether it's had plate tectonics or bursts of plate tectonics. So, this is an example of a calculation where it always has a stagnant lid. This is the temperature on the left, this is composition on the right, so you see a a crust in red forming, it actually gets quite thick, but it's delaminated from its base. So convection is sort of delaminating the crust here. And actually, um, a lot of heat is being transported by melting. Uh, what happens is that uh, the mantle partially melts, magma goes to the surface or near the surface, transporting heat, then it, um, it cools and uh, the crust is delaminated from the bottom. So there's actually, the <coughs> well, so-called heat pipe uh, heat transport uh, transports a lot of heat in these uh, calculations. And the crust reaches some sort of equilibrium thickness where there's a balance between magmatic resurfacing and delamination by convection. Um, and so... Um, when we plot various things versus time, particularly the um, heat budget, now there are too many too many lines on this plot. But anyway, I can tell you that um, if you plot the total heat transport, then it's it's 
basically overlain by the, by the line showing magmatic heat transport. So almost all of the heat transport in these Venus cases is magmatic, except near the end where normal convection or conduction can actually uh, can win. So that's one scenario. Um, so melting is very important here, and if we don't have melting switched on, the temperatures get really high and it can't lose heat and so on. Um, another, oh, we can also show that we, we can, I'll sort of skip this, but we're also sort of batching the geoid in some of these. Um, so by, by matching the um, sort of geoid and topography of Mars, we can constrain the effective Rayleigh number and hence the, uh, the viscosity. Okay, so this is our best, best fit case. But there seems to be too much magmatism. It doesn't match what people see on the surface of Venus, which is relatively little magmatism. So, the other um, possible case is that there were there was some type of plate tectonics happening occasionally, and that's what we see here. So here we see a burst of lithospheric overturn, and then it goes back to the stagnant lid mode. This is known as episodic lid. And then you see other bursts of, uh, of plate tectonic-like behavior. Here, happening again, more subduction, and then it shuts off. And this goes on throughout its history. So then when we look at the um, heat budget that, um, that's associated with these cases, now magmatism accounts for a much smaller fraction of the total heat budget, and instead... A lot of it is transported by uh, just a standard, you know, cooling of the oceanic, well, cooling of the lithosphere. So you resurface, the lithosphere is very thin, it cools, that loses heat, then you, you get an overturn, you resurface again, so you, that's why you see all these spikes. Um, so that seems to match observations of Venus of having less uh, magnetism. Oh, we're also running 3D models. But actually, the sort of uh, averaged um, evolution is very similar. And uh, we can also match geoid and topography ratios with these models. So um, we actually prefer the episodic model for, tr for matching all observations. And uh, recently, uh, postdoc Cedric has been coupling these models to the atmosphere. So volcanism produces volatiles, carbon dioxide and water, that go to the atmosphere. Atmosp atmospheric escape is modeled. This removes these things to space. And the atmosphere sets the surface temperature, which is the boundary condition for mantle convection. And so the, some details, the atmosphere model is a one-dimensional gray radiative convective model. Greenhouse gases uh, takes into account the variation of the sun's luminosity with time. Uh, the escape model includes hydrodynamic escape early on and then non-thermal escape mechanisms. Uh, and the efficiency of uh, escape decreases with time because it depends on the extreme ultraviolet flux from the sun. Not the total luminosity, but just the extreme ultraviolet flux. So, and you can run these, cal you can couple this to the calculations like the ones I just showed. Outgassing is very, you know, there are spurts because this is one of these episodic models. But the, the number of spurts decreases with time. This is then the, um, the composition of the atmosphere, or at least the partial pressures of carbon dioxide and water. So carbon dioxide doesn't change very much. Look, this is the pressure. I mean, it, <coughs> it's a very small uh, difference here. So this makes very little difference to CO2, but it does make quite a difference to water. Now, people say that Venus is very dry, but it does have about 30 ppm of water in the atmosphere. And this is enough, apparently, to make a large difference to the surface temperature. This shows an example of the one-dimensional atmospheric profile. And the difference between having 3 ppm of water and uh, 30 ppm of water is, is about uh, 200 Kelvin of surface temperature. So this is the predicted uh, evolution of surface temperature versus time. So it starts off at about 525 Kelvin, which is what you get from the carbon dioxide alone. And then, with time, the removal of water gets very gets less efficient because there's less of this extreme ultraviolet flux, and the water can build up more, and even this very small amount of water 
apparently causes the surface temperature to increase here up to a up to actually the um, by coincidence the present day surface temperature of Venus. <clears throat> I think that this case was chosen because it matches the present day. There are other cases. So for Venus, I think I've had 45 minutes. Anyway, so we prefer well. If you, if you have a stagnant lid, we predict that magnetism is very important, which you don't really see, so we prefer episodic overturn, and um, it seems like um, coupling to the atmosphere is uh, important. We're also modeling Venus, which I won't talk about. We're also modeling super-Earth, which Diana will talk about. Okay. <clears throat> right, so I'll skip through these. And um, reach my conclusions. Oh. You are going to talk about this, aren't you? No, <laughs> well, I'm out of time already, so. Time. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just say a, a few, a few brief words, which is that, um, <laughs> which is that, um, <clears throat> in Super Earth, the pressures, well, the pressures in the deep mantle are very much higher than those on Earth. For example, if it has 10 Earth masses, the pressures near the core mantle boundary would be about 10 times those at the pressure near Earth's core mantle boundary. And the physical properties can be greatly affected by these high pressures. Uh, one, one, one of them is viscosity. So viscosity increases with pressure in Earth, and it, so it should increase by a very large amount in uh, super-Earth. So we did, well, asked, uh, colleagues in London, um, John Brodholt and, and co-workers, to uh, calculate what the rheology should be in, uh, at these very high pressures, and we put that into convection models, and we get uh, things like this. So this is an Earth-like planet. These are increasingly large, and um, indeed, the viscosity gets fairly high in the, in the deep super-Earth mantles, but um, when you do a, a plot of the average profile, you find that actually the viscosity seems to reach some some value, but then it doesn't get any higher. Um, it doesn't get as high as what you would predict if the convection was adiabatic. So there must be something going on, and what, what happens? what's happening is that the temperature is not adiabatic. This is adiabatic. It's super adiabatic. And um, so it becomes super adiabatic because you know, there's a certain amount of internal heating, and in equilibrium, the mantle has to lose that heat. <coughs> and if if it's too cold, then it can't lose the heat. This it just stagnates. And so it, it just warms up because of this internal heating. And then it'll warm up until, until it can convect and lose the heat. So there's this self-regulation happening on a sort of local level that causes the temperature to adjust until the mantle can lose the, um, the specified internal heating. And this causes a self-regulation of the viscosity that means you get a more or less constant viscosity profile. All right, so that's the bottom line of that study. And um, so I'll just uh, put up the conclusions that Earth is unique, but we're interested in whether there are extrasolar planets like Earth, uh, various important effects like plate tectonics, compositional differentiation, coupling to the atmosphere. And I think we really have to focus in the future more on this coupling between the atmosphere and the interior. Okay, so the end.